Uh, hello, welcome uh, to this uh, session uh, on Ukraine. We're going to start without Ambassador Dobryansky, and she'll come and join uh, a little later. I wanted you to welcome. I wanted to welcome you to it. It's a. Uh, it's an important topic that the world has rather set aside these last few weeks and one that is, uh, it seems to me, reaching a really interesting uh, moment. The country uh, running out of funding, it says, within the next few weeks uh, to continue fighting for its defence uh, at a time when uh, European unity seems threatened, American funding uncertain. Uh, and this is uh, what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. We're going to open it up for questions uh, once we've got through uh, uh, the beginning of, of the discussion. I'd just like to introduce you very briefly uh, to my uh, panelists. Immediately to my left, Jacek Shevera, who's the head of Poland's National Security Bureau and a Secretary of State uh, for Poland as well. To his left, Dr. Henry uh, Wang, who is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Uh, we also have uh, Ambassador Paula Dobryansky, who's the vice chair of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, and finally, Fabian Sulig, who is the president and CEO of the European Policy Center. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for being here. If if I could start uh, with you, perhaps, uh, initially, uh, uh, Jacek Shivera, uh, the uh, fear from within Poland must be tremendous as we look towards the possibility uh, that Ukraine made a very real sense, simply run out of the means to continue ensuring its defense. Yes, so thank you uh, for having us. And uh, you're right that the situation in which uh, entire Eastern flank of NATO is uh, right now, um, when we observe the, the, the operation, the defense operation on Ukrainian soil, it's a situation in which we also are aware that it's a, a war which results and affects outcome much broader than the Ukraine itself. It's obvious. Um, and now we have a feeling that we are in an inflection point in which counteroffensive bring brings us, um, let's say, suboptimal results um, with the time um, in upcoming months, which will be very difficult for Ukrainians. And we observe with high attention what is going on in Brussels in upcoming days, also uh, in Congress in Washington, uh, with the support for Ukrainians. From Polish perspective, the most important aspect is that any form of talks, diplomatic process, uh, any form of looking forward for a final sustained solution cannot be done above the head of the Ukrainians. So it's their decision what they want to uh, achieve in this war uh, by defending their own territory, uh, their own internationally recognized borders in this aggression against Ukraine from uh, Russia. And if we are touching the point of um, looking at the outcome, at the potential result of this war, um, we have to get back to the beginning of this war. Also here in Qatar during the Doha Forum, uh, we cannot escape any form of comparisons between the war in Gaza in Ukraine. And there are many differences, but the most visible one is that positions in a war in Ukraine, the positions and the strategic expectations of both sides were openly expressed at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Uh, government and President Zelensky expressed very openly that the path for development of Ukraine he sees in the Western um, world in the European Union, in the NATO. Uh, and also, President Putin uh, expressed his expectation in a proposal which was declared on 21st of December um, 2021 to Washington and to Brussels headquarters uh, by stating that he expects the withdrawal of forces from Ukraine, withdrawal uh, instructors, um, withdrawal of uh, NATO to the borders of 1990s, 
And these are also one. Purposes for recent declarations and statements of President Biden, who is expecting that intentions of imperial Russian imperialism are far bigger than just Ukraine. But this also gives us a short perspective for potential protocol of disagreement for any form of dialogue. I'm not saying negotiations, but any form of dialogue on which finally one day Ukrainians will have to focus. In Gaza, we don't have such a protocol of disagreement. My understanding is that Hamas, in the first day of 7th of October, didn't have a final vision, final outcome of the war which may provoke. And Israel, even right now, don't have the vision of the strategical outcome which they want to achieve. This is the main difference, I think, which I cannot, cannot untouch, cannot be untouched in a place like this. It's, it's an important uh, distinction. Dr. Wang, to you, those fears on the eastern flank of uh, Europe and of NATO, uh, you have long called for an off-ramp to be given to Russia in this and for China to play a mediation role, as it has before between uh, Riyadh, for instance, and Tehran so successfully. Wouldn't the problem with that, going back to the points just made, be that ultimately Vladimir Putin's uh, vision, aims, strategic ambitions have long been clear and they do not stop? at the edge of Poland. What, what do you reply to that? Yes, uh, th thank you. Uh, no, I think this is a great uh, panel that we, we're talking about this, and, and the CCG would really be very uh, uh, honored to host a part of this. What what I think this, uh, this is really a uh, uh, very, very uh, challenging time in our history, uh, you know, after 77 years of a second world war, now we have, we're having a new war now on the European continent again. That's, that's, a, that's unimaginable, but 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 I think again, we are we are in the in the twenty uh, first century. We are much more prospering, much more uh, clever, much more uh, uh, you know our means are, are really uh, much more uh, abundant. So how can we uh, you know really make a piece out of this? So I think that's where I think probably China can can stand. You know, China has made it very clear. China's first uh, respect Ukraine sovereignty and territorial integrity. China Foreign Minister Wang Yi has said at the Munich Security Conference when the war broke out. And of course, uh, President Xi met uh, uh, Chancellor Ola Scholz. China said uh, no nuclear war should be fought in, in, in Ukraine. And when he met President Macron, he said, uh, you know, there's a, there should be no bombing of the civilian children. So I think, you know, I, I see this is really, uh, uh, it's it's really, I mean, I mean whatever reason uh, led to that, I mean, we all have to reflect. But, but, but the challenge is that we're having the war now. How to how to stop that? What's the what's the end game? How can we get out of that? So I think it it is probably more important now. We we need a new Minsk moment. We need a more more guarantors at the table. We need the UN to really call a peace summit. I I wrote an op at the New York Times uh, and last year when the war broke out. I said let's do a seven party talk. You know, basically P five member plus U plus Ukraine. And let's really sit down and talk and then see how we could end this. Because I see, uh, as we, we chat just a while ago, that, uh, the, the, you know, the funding for the war is, looks like losing some steam with a new election in the U.S. And then uh, also it's, it's really, uh, it's humanitarian crisis. Also, there's, there's so many, so much casualties. And then we, we are not having another one happening in the Middle East. So the war cannot afford to have so many crises. So, so I think it's important that China can play some active role in terms of uh, come at the table so become the only party that really hasn't got a a, a, a conflict with both sides and uh, China is the largest trading partner with both Ukraine and Russia and uh, so probably for China to have a good position if both both parties have a desire to come down China would be a good player at table to witness that to really probably mediate that and to be a guarantor of this peace process. Uh, Ambassador Dobryansky, were there to be a, a real peace process and discussions at this stage, and were Ukraine forced to lower its ambitions, would we not be stuck with the humanitarian catastrophe on the ground, but also a partition of Ukraine uh, de facto, uh, and and all that that would mean then, not just for the country, uh, but 
probably for the whole world in how it continues to address these kinds of crises. Well, let me first, um, Jacek made the comment about the current situation and its ramifications broadly. And so to answer your question, he also mentioned that we should be looking toward Ukraine. Ukraine has very specifically enunciated a, a 14 point peace plan and is very specific about what it looks for in that regard. So, however, you secondly have a situation where earlier on, well, it was Turkey that was brokering, by the way, the concept of humanitarian corridors. This was much earlier on. And at that time, actually, the Ukrainians were very much in favor of having a kind of humanitarian corridor to ensure on the humanitarian front that the issues were being addressed. Unfortunately, that never, there was never a cessation of the fighting. The Russian side came and met the two foreign ministers, Koleba and Lavrov, but that never translated on the Russian side in terms of a cessation. Why am I saying this? There's a real desire, I think, to have some kind of legitimate and very specific discussion here, but you, it takes two to tango in that regard. So one, there is a peace plan that the Ukrainians have put forward. Two, they already indicated in the humanitarian context a very direct willingness earlier on to have a, 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 you know, a, a, uh, these corridors set up, but we're well beyond that point. Where are we now? And to answer your question, but I had to give that back background, uh, bluntly speaking, far as I could see, uh, the Ukrainian side is uh, moving forward still with the counteroffensive. I think it's going more modestly here, but they're moving forward. I think that they themselves are open to a discussion, but they put it very clearly what are the terms they're looking at. And there has been no indication that it is going in that kind of direction. So it's too premature. To that to that point, uh, Dr. Zudig, the idea that Ukraine's 14-point plan that Ambassador Dobryansky mentions does call for the withdrawal of Russia to the pre-war uh, lines. There's no indication that Moscow is in any uh, position or has any desire to discuss this or consider it at a time when, uh, from the point of view of Kyiv, the very broad support that we saw from the start does seem threatened from the European point of view, because this has had an impact on European unity as the months have dragged on, but of course, because of the problem of American funding. Ukraine is not as and doesn't feel like it's in a stronger position as it was for a while. Do you agree? Well, it was to be expected that uh, as uh, the war continues, um, that uh, there is more discussion. Um, clearly, uh, there is a desire for peace uh, in many quarters, uh, but the reality is that Europe uh, made the right choice uh, when this conflict started. Uh, there was a clear recognition that appeasement would not work in the long run. It would not create uh, a lasting peace. Um, and I think the situation still applies. And it is true uh, that there are more discussions. Uh, some of those, it has to be said, uh, more to do with internal EU issues uh, than actually with Ukraine. Um, the difficulty with dealing with uh, a kleptocrat uh, like Orban, um, who is utilizing Ukraine for his own purposes, um, I think is something we have to deal with. But I think the overall support um, is not really in question. Um, it is a very difficult situation. And I do think that uh, we cannot at this moment in time see any movement from the Russian side on the big issues, but also on some of the other issues. And maybe that could be a first step, that if there was some form of uh, acceptance by Moscow that uh, we need to make progress on issues like the grain exports from Ukraine, um, like the abducted children, then maybe that could lead to a situation where um, there could be talks later on. But at the moment, there is no attempt from Moscow to make any concessions. Uh, Dr. Wang, do you believe that there could be at some point any movement on the part of Moscow at this stage? 
Well, I, I, I think that uh, really, you know, it has to be the a desire from both sides. I, I, I can see because the, because in the past people say, oh, this war is going to be over pretty soon. Now offensive is going to be very effective. But now we see this really prolonged. Uh, we don't know who, when would be the ending. But also, I think that there's a fatigue now, probably in the U.S. and in Western country in general, that uh, that the people don't want to see this war prolonged and then a continuous fatigue. Same same in the Russian. So. So I think it, it's it's catch twenty two now. Both sides probably wants to see some kind of ending on that. So the, this is the moment I think. Then uh, you know, China, U.S., EU can probably comes in particular UN, making some proposals, particularly get get people on the table. So we we, we started to see Russian travels around. <laughs> Putin was in um, in the Middle East. Uh, you know, the Foreign Minister of Russia was spoken here yesterday. So people starting to talk now. I think it's a good sign that we start to talk, and I hope that we can. Have more talks, particularly at the UN level. The Secretary General can call on um, P5 member country plus Ukraine plus EU, and then let's sit down and talk. And and then we can see what give and take. What what are the pros and cons? How can we end this? So so that there is a, a hope that let's get into the, this kind of a dialogue, rather than say oh let's fight until last Ukraine or let's fight until the last person in Russia. You know that doesn't really make a good sense because. Uh, I think it's really risky. We 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 continue that aspect because also uh, we cannot afford too many war going on in this world. I mean that's already too dangerous for all of us. And I think it's time that we have to come to the rational, uh, common sense and stop this war. Um, Ambassador, in with the point on on that because your question and then I don't see Ukraine at this stage of looking at sitting at the table because one there's been no interest as you said uh, from the Russian side, but secondly. They also look at uh, their own leverage, if you will, from the battlefield. And in that context, I think there's a real strong desire to persevere at this stage. Yeah, I, I just wanted to support um, Henry's point that I, I do think that China has a role to play, um, not only as a mediator, but also as um, probably one of the last voices which is heard in Moscow and where there's potentially some reaction. And I do think that we have seen um, some positive moves um, from China. Uh, I think I would especially highlight uh, the uh, absolute condemnation of the use of nuclear uh, weapons uh, in the conflict. Um, I think there's more which could be done. And in particular, uh, there are aspects of this war which have a global influence. Um, when we're talking about grain in particular, I think there's something where uh, China could uh, have more influence on Moscow to ensure that the grain exports are running again and that um, the food security issue, uh, which has been created by Russia's targeting uh, of uh, the food sector in, in Ukraine, is addressed. It might be, uh, one last fast one, 30 seconds. It might be worth noting on China two things. China does have about, I believe, 40% of dependence on Ukraine's grain, and so it has a vested interest. But you know the other interesting tidbit is, and it's worth remembering, President Zelensky did reach out and asked for a phone call with Xi Jinping, and they did have it, and the topic was very focused. It was on a humanitarian one. Uh, Zelensky asked for China's help on the abduction of the Ukrainian children, and uh, uh, it was registered. I don't know that you know there's been action taken but there has been such outreach from the Ukrainian side to engage China. In the meantime, in terms of the pressure on Moscow to join in the talks, whether it comes from Beijing or elsewhere, yeah, Vera, the fear, I suppose, from Warsaw must be that there was a sense from the start that Vladimir Putin would be playing the clock, that the, the, the Western unity that we saw in the beginning was likely over time to crumble. And that is very, in a very real sense, happening just later this week with fears that uh, the question of European ac uh, Ukrainian accession to the EU will be blocked, as will the next tranche of European help. The eastern flank of Europe must be extremely worried at the increasing disunity of Europe over this. If that ends, then Ukraine will have very little on its side. Okay, so, yeah, very good and very broad question. Uh, maybe I will refer first to a few points of uh, my colleagues and then step to the to the European aspect. So um, maybe the first part, I fully agree that any form of talks is always necessary, even if they are not negotiations, even if we are only 
focused on stating the protocol of disagreement. It's important to have it, fully agree on that. And what I want to remind also is that on the beginning of war, in the first months of war, there were negotiations and there were talks which were conducted on Belarus. We took part as a um, representatives of Poland also in these negotiations in three phases. Also, the foreign minister of um, Ukraine and um, counterparts from, from Russia took place in it, uh, took part in it. Uh, so, so the process was present till the Bucha and Irpin happened. And in the moment when the cruelty has reached that moment, all the negotiations um, couldn't take place anymore. But the time for that will come. The question is how we can predict not the solution, not the outcome, the path to the outcome. And this is something that I cannot agree with. So we don't need another Minsk moment. Minsk moment was the moment which resulted in a war which we are witnessing right now. Without Minsk agreements, uh, this war wouldn't go this way. And having said that, what I believe we need something strongly different. And there is a huge potential for China also to play a role in that process. All right, that part we have. So maybe now, less diplomacy and more practice. I know that in political forums and diplomatic discussions, it's always about the moment, how we can approach the, the talks, the negotiations, the strategic outcome. But at the end of the day, during the war, capabilities, especially during the war at attrition, capabilities and potential, has the major role to play. And from that perspective, yes, we can say the counteroffensive was suboptimal, our expectations were maybe too high, but in public discussion, we are omitting some different perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, Odessa support is working. It was blocked, now it's working. 200 ships left Odessa support for recent months. Black Sea is available for trade right now with obstacles, of course, but the fleet uh, of Russian forces is not attacking a ships. This allows Ukraine to partially manage the grain export, to tackle the food crisis, but also to operate within the economy of this state for a future. What we have to also underline is the level of defense industry, which is operational now in Ukraine. First phase of war was the moment of obtaining a lot of donations of military equipment, munition, weapons from the Western uh, countries. But what we have to be aware of is that 65 to 70% of defense industry is the capacity which is already engaged of Ukrainian defense industry. They have capabilities to even expand the production of munition within the capabilities which they already have. So there are also a bad news for aggressor. They can export the grain. They can increase the capabilities of production of munition in a protracted war. And the third, two thirds of support and donations in an economical dimension, not the military one, two thirds are coming from European Union. It, because Europe doesn't expand the production of munition, of weapons in that size, what America has. But in upcoming months, with the investments and know-how from Western world, Ukrainians can develop a very effective defense industry, also with the production of ammunition. If we count in also the artificial intelligence optimization, which is available, and the potential switch to the war 
industrial mode, it might be significant difference in a negotiating position in upcoming six or seven months. The question is, how long Western world want to support Ukraine? And words as long as possible should be stated very clearly and realized in a real world. Um, I wanted to challenge you a little bit uh, <laughs> because uh, you were talking about uh, European disunity and I would not overstate that. Um, I think, uh, yes, we have 27 sovereign nations uh, which happen to live out their differences in public, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, we won't get to the right response in the end um, because I think in the end uh, there is a recognition which is extremely widespread uh, in the European Union that this is an existential threat to the European Union. It is not a local war in Ukraine. It is about uh, an imperialist agenda of Russia, which will not stop with Ukraine uh, unless it is stopped there. Um, so I think in the end, we are going to get there. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy. Um, but uh, the overwhelming majority of people in Europe and the overwhelming majority of governments are supporting a cause. And if we are not going to be able to do it through the instruments of the European Union, then there are other routes which we can go down. So I wouldn't overstate uh, the differences, although, of course, there is more discussion now. Uh, but in the end, I think we will get to the right um, uh, and solution. And that Mr. Orban can be convinced to set aside the threat of his veto later this week. You're confident? Um, he is using the threat of veto um, because, unfortunately, we haven't reformed our voting system. So we need to address this. Um, but even if that is the case, uh, whether a deal will be found or not, there will be a way of channeling the support. Um, if it doesn't come through the European Union, then it will come from the individual member states. Um, but it is going to come. A Ambassador Dobriansky, what about the question of American funding? Can a solution be found there? On American funding, well, right now, uh, I think CNN was reporting, at least I saw today, Zelensky was in Argentina, and I think he's making his way to Washington, D.C. to meet with President Biden. And so clearly, I think that underscores and highlights the importance uh, the administration is attaching to this issue. They've been very clear on it, that funding for Ukraine at this time is absolutely crucial. Um, at the same time, Zelensky will be giving a briefing and meeting with senators. I think there was an earlier meeting which he uh, did not take, but is doing this firsthand. So uh, I think one, these are all good steps. I'm glad that uh, he's made this trip there. I'm glad that the administration is highlighting the issue. Clearly, it's Im important. It's important for Ukraine's funding, particularly on the military context, for all the reasons already stated. The stakes are high right now, and I think that Ukraine wants to uh, ensure that it is able to push Russian, uh, the Russians off of their territory and re-secure their own sovereignty. Okay, interesting, both of your optimisms about, about that. And Dr. Wang, to put to you that, assuming then that the wrangling in Washington and Brussels is local and punctual and that we overcome it and that the West remains united in this idea that goes far beyond in the end just the borders of Ukraine and was uh, the idea that a rules-based Western uh, sense of unity around the idea that one country can't invade another and that democracy needed defending and uh, that Ukraine needed helping, that the acceptance of a Chinese mediation and a partition of Ukraine would put an end to all that. And that's not something either that Brussels or Washington would accept. Well, that's probably, uh, you know, the current situation. The, the, the thing is that uh, I think the this prolonged war, I mean, is out of expectation of anybody. It's, it's, it's taking so long now. It's over almost two years now. And uh, so we don't know how long it's going to take. But but uh, as we see the U.S. election is coming, we, and we see also Republicans are, are, are losing some steam in supporting this uh, this war. And and, and, and and the same is probably in some European countries, too. So so we will see how, how, how this is going to end. I mean, we, we have to be realistic in the end. Uh, to 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 solve this crisis, of course. I mean, uh, you know, sovereignty has to be respected. But then, uh, again, uh, you know, we we need to find a way. I mean, we need to talk. Uh, uh, who knows? I mean, uh, there there could be a compromise uh, 
uh, from from both sides. And uh, and then in that, if that is if both sides fail, there's a note not ha it's in their interest to continue this war and they really want to step down. Where is the where is the ladder? Who who is going to be <laughs> graceful to let them come down? Sitting at the table, say, okay, I'm giving you a face. I'm I'm willing to do compromise this. And then the other side, okay, we can do that as well. So we need that kind of atmosphere rather than, you know, uh, really we add a few, we really say, okay, let's fight, let's let's do it. But, you know, there's casualty, there's there's human life lost. And uh, and we cannot uh, really, uh, the world has already tired of saying that. Uh, so, so I think the resolute to really, uh, to fight on both sides is probably, uh, uh, needs to be questioned, but also the support uh, from both sides is 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 winning down as well. So so I'm I'm really thinking it's time for that the UN and it's time that the P5 and uh, and plus EU and Ukraine should start talk and uh, not saying that talk is going to be one sided. Let's let's get all the ideas on the table and what are the perspective and this war and what are the give and take. What are the, what are the reality we have to recognize? What are the Things we can regain. What about uh, join the NATO? What about join the EU? What about lift the sanction? What about pulling out of the troops? You know, I mean, all things can be talked. Uh, uh, rather than we just say, no, let's not talk. We have to fight. And uh, well, you know, that's one option. We we also have other options. So I think in that sense, China is uh, a set of an envoy for the peace talks. You know, China has appointed an envoy for that. I visited the uh, Ukraine and, and all the other countries. President should talk to Zelensky. And China is willing to do more. I mean, I mean, UN should be really more put into this act exercise and and really starting talking for the how to end this war rather than how to continue this war. We need to really have change a little bit of talking into into peaceful end rather than continue to fight. Doctor uh, Zuli, I think um, yes, we have to move forward. Um, but the question for me is, in the end, uh, what kind of signal are we giving? Um, there has been very widespread support for the territorial integrity of Ukraine, um, for sovereignty of Ukraine. Um, if we are going in a direction which talks about partition, which talks about um, accepting some of the things which uh, in the end have just been put into place by Putin's Russia. Uh, they weren't there before. Um, they are uh, created by this war. And now he would be rewarded um, for actually starting this war of aggression. And I think we have to be very, very careful because what message that would give, not only to Ukraine, not only uh, to the rest of the Euro European uh, continent, but globally, it would mean that if you are stronger, if you are able to inflict a huge amount of damage on yourself and on others, then you get rewarded in the end. So I think we need to be very careful about how we move ahead um, and uh, I think in the end and it's something coming back to the first comments which were made uh, what has to be clear is that Ukraine has to be in the driving seat um, and I would fully expect that if that is not the case then Ukraine will also continue to fight regardless of what the support is like uh, what the international situation is like because for Ukraine this is a matter of survival it's existential uh, because we have heard from the Russian side that uh, they are intending to wipe Ukraine off the map. Uh, so this is something which has to be prevented in the end. If, 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 if I may, I certainly totally agree with what Fabian just said. I think his point needs to be underscored here because, you know, there have been some uh, attempts of, you know, moving forward with uh, negotiations, uh, uh, elements like that. And quite frankly, uh, uh, as you pointed out, you know, an acceptance of the uh, aggression and uh, a partition or any other kind of, of proposal like that is, is really, it would send one of the most egregious signals, I think, not just only to Ukraine, but to the global community. And if I may, uh, Yatsik mentioned, you know, the issue of fa fatigue. And I'd like to say that, first of all, I think uh, one of the things that can certainly be done here is to underscore the geopolitical implications of this issue. One is the undermining of the kind of rules 
based order, if you will. It also, secondly, it also, I mean, this kind of unprovoked uh, aggression um, uh, and literally attacking the kind of, of standards that we have had uh, really is very threatening to all. And this goes to also the security of, let's just say, the transatlantic community. And you asked that question, I mean, about the neighborhood in this case. Uh, Poland has proposed a permanent base. The Baltic countries are very concerned. Um, even on energy, Germany uh, has shifted in terms of its, uh, and other parts of Europe have shifted in terms of this issue of energy dependence on, on Russia. Uh, which has uh, been a major shift, uh, I think, an implication here. But let me just mention two last, uh, uh, that the community, global community, needs to be reminded of. The threat is not only what happens thereafter if one accepts the current situation, then one can only wonder what that will mean for the European community beyond. But also, I was very struck by the fact that the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida came to the United States and delivered a speech at Johns Hopkins University in which he talked about how what happens in Ukraine affects the security of the Indo-Pacific community. And he stated it quite clearly. And finally, we've already touched upon it, this situation has a really um, a, a significant humanitarian implication um, in terms of food security, and in terms of also the almost 11 million refugees who are dispersed throughout Europe and other locations. I mean, all of these factors, the, commu the, the, the uh, communities and our people have to, across the globe, be reminded of these circumstances. They can't just be left adrift. Thank you, Your Excellency, on that question of the implications for uh, the geopolitical order, but also very real preparations that are being made in Poland for the fact that you guys expect you'll be next. If Ukraine is allowed to fall or partition is accepted, you, Poland is actually preparing a three-year plan because it believes in a very real sense uh, that it, this will not be the end and, and the danger would be specifically for you. So my role is to assess the worst scenario in those three years. We believe that we won't be next because we believe that in three years we will have the potential which will deter potential imperialistic uh, ambitions from any form of uh, aggression towards uh, Eastern flank. And if we are touching the aspect of uh, global perspective, Once again, let's try to be a practical, guys. We are meeting in Doha, in the Middle East. Do we really want to believe that we should accept the reality in which the stronger state can impose the solution of, on the borders of smaller, much smaller, much poorer equipped neighbor? Is it the place in which we want to say it? No, we want to believe in a trust and respect for international borders, international law, and if two-state solution is agreed, it should be respected. If the borders were agreed and someone gave up with his nuclear weapon, it should be respected. And here in Doha, we cannot agree on the solution in which anyone can violate the agreements of international law just because it's stronger, bigger, or well-equipped. That's it. On, on which I'd love to open it up to questions. If, anybody, if anyone in the audience has has any for our panelists, please, we have uh, microphones that can be brought.
Thank you for the fascinating panel. Omar Ashour, a friend of Ukraine. Uh, a question for uh, Dr. Svira and Dr. Wang, two questions. So the first is, uh, so the, national, the Polish National Security Agency gave NATO 36 months, three years before it gets attacked by Russia. I'd rather be alarmist than ambushed, but can you tell us a bit on the basis of that forecast? If you can elaborate a bit more. And for Dr. Wang, so China was an observer in 1994 uh, Budapest Memorandum. Um, we know that one of the security guarantors became the aggressor, and the two others waited nine years before they actually support Ukraine. So that's Russia, UK, and the US. Uh, but China, how far would it go to guarantee uh, if we reached a, some sort of a plan, how far would it go? Would it you know, provide very solid assurances or not? Thank you. Dr. Sudi, perhaps first. Um, was that for me or? So, uh, yes, um, thank you for, for mentioning about those three years. Uh, maybe on the beginning, I will just underline that in precise quotation of my, my statement, there I said, to avoid the war, Eastern flank should be prepared for confrontation in three years. What exactly was on my mind and what exactly I want to express also right now is that we have to be aware that the moment on, of confrontation is a process in which we have to be ready for in three years. Because decision about the conventional full-scale war is always taken a few years before. Even the Ukrainian war is the evidence that the decision was made a few years earlier. This decision might be taken by our counterparts, by our hostile neighbors in three years. The question is what we will do in the period of three years to prevent the war. And this is the perspective which we have to be focused on. Uh, so if that answers your question and that makes sense, so this is what was my intention and what I thought about this. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for your question. I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, current, the current war going on, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very unusual. It's not a conventional, you know, in the past then, like in the Second World War, in the Vietnam War, in the, you know, in the past war. This is the war that we, you know, in fact, Russia is fighting Ukraine, but in fact, Russia is fighting the, uh, the NATO is fighting the West. The, this war is supported by the U.S. So it's really, uh, you know, the, the Russians, Russia is fighting the West, or West is fighting Russia. It's really a big, uh, in, in the nuclear age, you know, this is really a war in the nuclear age. You know, we, whether we, we're going to have a threat of a nuclear war, we don't know. I mean, this is very dangerous, actually, very dangerous. So, so what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we have to be realistic. How, how, how long are we going to sustain this war? And uh, that's where I think China is, is, is a good, you know, good position because China was never in any party, was not really uh, involved in this war and can be a very good uh, mediator and peacemaker uh, to, together with UN and uh, to really to promoting the peace process. Because, you know, as we're saying, it's just, of course, you, Ukraine has to be respected. Their will has to, uh, has to be, re, you know, fulfilled. But, but the thing is that behind Ukraine is the whole West. And Russia is fighting the whole West. The fight, West is fighting Russia. So, and then we are in the nuclear age. We're not in a conventional war. So, how how long they can sustain this? How how you know? Uh, it's really a question. Board. So so what I'm saying is that uh, you know China can be a good uh, balance into to to be at the table to say, hey guys, don't don't fight and let's let's talk. And uh, and then whatever it have to be agreed upon by both sides to really reach the the conclusion. So. It's not that one-sided. It has to be mutually acceptable. So China would really see some mutually acceptable conclusions that we hope to, to strive to really to end this war. Dr. Zilek, to you. Yeah, I just wanted to add something on um, the Poland's preparation. Um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that the whole of Europe um, has now realized, um, some countries realized it earlier than others, but the whole of Europe has realized um, that we cannot rely 
uh, on interdependence to guarantee our security. Um, so there will be a major investment in security, not only financial, but also political. And we've seen, for example, uh, Finland and Sweden joining NATO um, is a very clear sign of also the changing uh, way we are approaching uh, security across Europe. Um, that is unfortunate. I would wish to live in a world where that wasn't necessary. Uh, but the reality is um, that this is now a case we have to prepare for. Um, I do very much hope um, also with Henry that we can avoid it because it is um, such a horrific scenario, um, not only in terms of conventional warfare, but what it might also mean in terms of nuclear warfare. But the belief that um, by being weak, we can stop Russia, I think is exactly the wrong direction to go. We have to show that we are able to defend ourselves, and that's the only way uh, we can deter Russia. I think it's an important by, and by the way, a quick footnote, I think it's also worth uh, underscoring the fact that it's not only Europe that's also preparing, and I already mentioned not only in the military context, but also in terms of energy. There was this concern about the weaponization of energy by Moscow, and the end result, I mean, have been some striking changes, like uh, Germany uh, never before had an LNG facility. It does now have its own. And others are looking at this kind of independence of their own energy sources. But the second is that also other countries and other regions, like in the Indo-Pacific, and I'm going to highlight that because Japan historically has never had a heightened defense budget, and it has heightened its defense budget, which is very significant. Korea has made some shifts. And the obvious concern is the ramifications of what happens in Ukraine, that it will send a signal to other authoritarian regimes and what kinds of steps or actions they could take potentially. So actually, it's it's something that I think it's a fair point, you know, that's being affected, not just only uh, having its effect in Europe, but also in other locations as well. We probably have time for for another question. Okay, the microphone. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Andrei Kuzmenko. I am ambassador of Ukraine to this beautiful country, and I would like to extend my sincerest gratitude for the organizers and for all the panelists for such incredible discussions. Indeed, uh, next February will mark the uh, 10th anniversary of this neo-colonial war, which became the war of genocide of the Ukrainian nation. It is longer than the First World War. It is longer than the Second World War. Uh, all the world is concerned about that. Uh, we have heard concern, big concern. Unfortunately, only the military aid assistance, financial assistance to Ukraine could stop this war uh, since this is existential war for Ukraine and the war for elimination of Ukraine for Russia. Uh, in 1993-1994, being a young diplomat, I was involved in the drafting of the Lisbon Protocol and uh, the Budapest Memorandum. I was working for the nuclear disarmament at the time, mea culpa. I'm guilty. Uh, yeah. But uh, right now, uh, we have to learn the lessons. We are in a beautiful, peaceful Doha, but the region is quite difficult. And the uh, peace in the region is a result of check and balances achieved through many, many years of negotiations, of uh, different political processes. Unfortunately, this war has destroyed worldwide system of check and balances of the international law. It made the international organizations insufficient. It, this is just simply uh, worth mentioning that Russia still have weaker right in the United Nations. Weak uh, League of Nations after the Helsinki bombing in one week 
excluded Russia from the League of Nations, 10 years of the full-scale conflict. Uh, I'm certain that only the military uh, victory of Ukraine will stop this conflict. Each uh, other decision, protracted war, which will uh, give opportunities for our kids to fight. And if Ukraine fail in such protracted war, all the European countries will send their son to fight. This should be taken into due account. But my question is, being in the beautiful Doha, one more time, what lessons should be learned by the politicians of the region, by the politicians of so-called Global South, since the example of Putin's aggression is quite attractive for someone. We see Venezuela case right now. And what do we hear? Deep concern, that is all. So what should be done to avoid such situation in the future? Thank you. Does anyone keen to take that question, Ambassador, perhaps? I'll, I'll say first, uh, Ambassador, you're right to point out that it's been 10 years, it'll be the 10th anniversary, because 2014, with the illegal annexation of Crimea and the aggression in the uh, Donbass region, I think you're right to uh, underscore, uh, to me, the 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 biggest lesson is is that you cannot and and you said it earlier you cannot let such aggression just stand and you cannot reward such aggression if we do that then we have no international rule based order and standards by which we respect one another's sovereignty so in that case i know that right now also you know october 7 has been under discussion here as to what happened um i think the fundamental uh, you know point is is that that is not the way of going forward <laughs> and in the case of ukraine you're right to point out it's virtually the elimination attempt to eliminate an entire country an independent, sovereign country. And I think that we cannot stand for that. And if we do not speak out and do not take the correct steps, then what, are, what do we stand for? So much, I'm afraid that brings us to the end. And on that, thank you very much indeed to all of you for, for having been here. I hope the notes of optimism that we hope that we heard uh, today will, uh, will turn out to be, uh, to be correct. Thank you so much to all of you for taking part. Thank you.